Hello everyone and welcome to episode 397 of the MTG Goldfish Podcast. I'm Seth, probably better known as Seth Red Olive, and we got the full crew here this week kicking things off with the owner of MTG Goldfish, Richard. How are you this fine Monday, Richard? Hey Seth, uh, in the middle of a heat wave playing Dominar United, <laughs> but... Uh... It's not too bad where I am compared to Krim. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, Krim, we, we have another co-host in Krim, who uh, normally we have a hard time getting up, but apparently it's so hot that you just can't sleep where Krim is. Krim, how hot is it <laughs> where you are at the moment? It's a little unholy. It's a little unholy. It, it is, like, <laughs> very hot. <laughs> it's mega delirious. Good time to play some burn, play some burn decks, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, stay hot on and off. You know, the board. Oh, my Lord, it's hot. <laughs> uh, so anyway, today we're mostly going to be talking about uh, Dominary United. We got our early results. The set is out in digital. I don't think it's officially out in paper until Friday, but we got our first tournament results. We've been playing the set in various formats. So we wanted to talk about what Dominary United is actually doing now that it's able to be played. We also got some news about a potential competing game for uh, Magic coming from Disney that we wanted to mention. We got some new judge promos and then, of course, answer your fish mail questions. So that's the overview for today. Before we get into it, a reminder that today's show was brought to you by Card Conduit. And Card Conduit, they're the easiest way to sell your Magic cards. And if you're tired of all the hassles that are involved with buy listing your cards, Card Conduit lets you skip over all the typing, all the time, all the work that it takes to sell your cards. With their curated service, you can send in as many cards as you want with a buy list value of a dollar or more and pay just a 5% service fee. And if you want to put in a bit of effort, you can use their sorted service where you list and sort your cards in advance and pay just a 2% fee. And no matter which option you choose, you're going to get a detailed report with the results in a fast payment once your order is processed, and you can even get another 10% off if you head over to cardconduit.com slash mtggoldfish. Card Conduit, they're the easiest way to sell your magic cards, so thank you to Card Conduit for supporting the show. And let's talk some magic. Let's start with the big news. Well, new standard. We have standard rotation. We have Dominary United. I've been playing a lot of standard. Have uh, how about you guys? Have you guys been playing standard at all since uh, we got Dominator United? Oh, so much standard! Oh my God, yes. I've been playing standard on Moto and Arena. I I, I have witnessed Ooh, double double. I, I have witnessed all of the meta <laughs> games, all of them. <laughs> so so before we get into like what we've been playing in the meta. What do you think of Dominary is standard so far? I mean, I know it's only been like a weekend. We've had five days of new standard or something. So this is all subject to change. This is very early results. But what are the early results? How you been liking it? Uh, what do you think the meta looks like? I thoroughly have enjoyed it. Uh, the, the format is dialed back on power and I'm in love. Uh, it, it feels, I don't know. It feels like there's no one snowball card that I just instantly lose the game for letting it, like hit the board, right? Uh, I I feel like I I can outplay and make like make decisions and whatnot and like no face roll cards. So I've thoroughly enjoyed this. All right, let's let's yeah, let's get to uh, the elephant in the room, okay? <laughs> Everyone's playing okay. black. Liliana yeah. is everywhere. Um, they, they, they had a challenge. I think the top 16 decks were all black based. Uh, if you look at the Goldfish metagame, 65% of decks are playing Lily. 73% are playing Meat Hook Massacre. Uh, Tenacious Underdog, 61% Infernal. Like the, the whole top cards overall is just a blacklist, right? Infernal Grass, Cut Down, Duress, Tenacious Underdog, Children, Graveyard, Trespasser, Soren, and uh, Reckoner Bankbuster, the honorary black card in there. Um, yeah. If you look at the decks, though, it's no one has decided what the best black shell is. You have like Orzov, you have Demir, you have Rakdos, you have Esper, you have Grixis. So people just play black X. Um, and people are very excited to play Liliana. I know on Moto everyone's playing Liliana like it's it, all these like boomer jun people like came out of the woodworks they're like <laughs> finally I can play with my moto collection and everyone is jamming lilies um so that's <laughs> that's interesting when I when I play on arena though it's much more varied a lot more red based aggro a lot more like just weird decks people are trying out because I guess people don't want to craft lilies or something uh, but still still a healthy share of lilies but not as dramatic as magic online where 
I know I'm playing like Boomer Jun players left and right. I mean, you still play a lot of black base decks, Utterine. At least I have still played against a lot of blast, uh, black base decks. Although, I do think the economy plays into that. Like, on Arena, Lily was like, I think it went up in price now, but it was super cheap because it had been reprinted a bunch. People might already have their copies and use rental programs. When if you want to build one of these like mid rangey piles like Rakdos or Orzov or something on Arena, you're looking at like 50 ish rares or mythics like you're it's a it's a big initial investment. So I guess I'm not surprised that you see more. Is it Spellslinger, Mono Red, like these cheaper to put together, but still like competitive enough or competitive looking enough decks on Arena compared to Magic Online. But well, what were you going to say, Crim? Sorry, I, I cut you off there. I so I've been playing Mono Black since like the early access event. I, I think Mono Black is like so sick right now. Like it is such a good, uh, good deck. I mean, Mono Black is the deck that actually won the challenge. Uh, if you, we don't really have a ton of tournament results. The best results we have so far are, are the Magic Online challenge, which is the one where literally the top 30 decks were all black based, uh, mid range decks of one kind or another. But number one overall was, was straight up Mono Black, just like playing the black cards, having the most consistent mana. Although I do wonder, like, when it comes to Mono Black, the challenge I run into is like, Okay, the mana's good enough that I can splash another color, especially if you're a, a color combination that has a pain land, like Rakdos, for example, or Orzov, for example. Is there, like, enough of a reason to stay mono black when it's so easy to be like, oh, I have a Blood Tithe Harvester in my deck, or oh, I have Feeble of the Mirror Breaker in my deck, or oh, I have a Wandering Ramper in my deck, with a relatively low-cost splash? So, I don't know. I kind of feel like this splash is free enough if you get a pain land that... I would be surprised if Mono Black actually remained the the actual best deck in some sort of two color pile w based on black, but some sort of black splash deck might be better. What do you, what do you think about that, Krim? What's the upside of staying Mono Black rather than splashing? I like being able to consistently cast Invoke Despair. That card has been absolutely disgusting right now, but then it made me Invoke is good. I've been thinking about it like Invoke Jadar and something that I've been playing like. Because I, you know, like since like playing the Mono Black deck, I realized Jadar might be good. Uh, again, Ooh, because wow. it's good anti-Lily tech. Uh, it comes down before a Lily, so you can't just play Lily, make them sack. Uh, you always have a decayed zombie to throw at them. So, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that might be the play. But, I, I do... Yeah, I was gonna say, the, the I do black, think that's something to think the about. The deck counters itself, if, if that makes sense. Like, you have Tenacious Underdog, and if you're on the draw, like, your Lily is not safe, right? They can always just blitz in underdogs whenever they want. But then, like, Trespasser counters underdog, right? Like, the, like the deck just <laughs> yeah. all like, counters itself in a big circle. So it's, like, kind of interesting. And when people add a color, they try to metagame. Like, most decks, like, 80, 90% of the cards are black. Right? Like the black cards are solid enough to fill out the entire deck. Like you don't have anything to cut. You're really just trying to like sneak in like maybe some farewells, a wandering emperor, uh, maybe spell pierce, uh, fable the mirror breaker. Like you're just trying to sneak in like a little tech here or there. But if you just play four of everything that's good in, in black, you, you have a full deck, right? Like you, you have to start going to like three of infernal grasps or three of cut downs or something. Um, but like, just tenacious underdog trespasser Liliana, uh, your like eight removal spells, like that's like a whole deck, right? So yeah, it's just yeah. really that deep. It's the most jund looking deck, right? Like all the cards are individually powerful, which is why everyone's just playing this. But I don't think black is unbeatable, or even like the best colors. I think people are just playing it because it's easy right now, but. Um, there, there's a lot like if people are trying to invoke to spare you there's a lot of ways to stop that right if their whole plan is to Liliana you there's a lot of ways to stop that if people just start actually building around it yeah, I, I think that's true, and it is super early, but I do think there are ways to like fight against a black deck, and I think part of it too is just like the black deck's super easy to build. Like, I yeah. think anyone could sit down and be like, oh, Tenacious Underdog into Liliana into Sorn into Invoke Despair. Like, that's a lot of really powerful <laughs> cards. That'll probably win me some games. Like, are there any one drops in these colors? Oh, there's a couple of removal spells. And you just, like, built the deck that won the challenge. So I think that it's just, like, simple. I've been impressed by some of the more complicated cards. Like, Braids is a card that I think is kind of a sleeper. When that was first spoiled, I was like, oh, this card looks really bad. But then I've got to play with it and play against it a little bit. And I think that it's actually a lot better than it looks when you consider you can, like, sack blood tokens that your opponent doesn't have. And there's, like, all these little synergies. So I think, like, 
we're in like simple deck mode. It's week one. You want to be aggressive. You want to play something that you know is powerful. Black is really easy because we have a lot of good remaining black cards. This survive rotation. We got a bunch of new good black cards. So you just throw them all together and you got a good deck. But I don't think this is what the meta is going to look like a month from now or something. I think we're going to see a, a lot of change. Not to say that black is bad. Like <sighs> Meat Hook Massacre in specific is just like a busted card. And yeah. I think that's a reason to, yeah. to play black. So I don't think black is ever going to go away as long as Meat Hook Massacre is legal in the format but i do think that we're not going to see the top 30 decks of a 32 be all black based decks or whatever in the future i think we're going to see more diversity than that so many meatballs you know you know what's funny the black deck has so many life loss cards like infernal grasp um tenacious underdog but you never feel like you're short on life uh between like trespasser <laughs> gaining life meatball gaining life and soren like you Children. Like you don't you don't yeah. need sideboard cards for aggro like your deck can just like out sustain them even with all this life loss so it's kind of crazy i am starting to wonder a little bit if meat hook's going to be a problem like i've so i've been trying to play some aggro decks i've been trying to play some aggro decks and it is really devastating like wrathing the board is already really good if you're trying to go aggro and like get in under the black mid-range decks but when your wrath is also like gain four life or gain six life or something it just becomes like kind of unbeatable a lot of the time so that's a card that i'm gonna i'm gonna keep an eye on uh it's already been really good it was good before rotation and it seems like it's even better now post rotation let me, let me it's what's keeping aggro down yeah let me introduce you to Innistrad tech. So Liliana came and everyone's excited, right? But Delver of Secrets and a Spell Pierce will take care of this deck. Like, you you meatball for like four or whatever for six mana and you just eat a Spell Pierce, right? Like, it's, yeah. it's, it's kind of gross. And like, you can protect Delver quite easily with the card pool because we have the one mana spell that phases out um, Delver. So the way you normally beat Delver is you end of turn removal. And then you untap your removal again, or you use removal that doesn't target, like Liliana. But now you can kind of just phase out Delver, and like it keeps your curiosity thing on it. So I think Delver is actually pretty strong, and you have variations. You can go like Mono Blue, uh, you can play Ledger Shredder, you can play Haughty Jin, you can go Is It, you can play more burn based. So yeah. I, I, I feel yeah. like like you can't play this like five mana mid rangey invoke despair and get away with it right like you just eat a counter spell to the face and like die to a one drop or a two drop like as modern intended right so <laughs> like trust me oh, Lily but... is beatable right just just look towards modern yeah. to see why liliana's like complete garbage in the format uh and then like there are ways to do it right like wedding ring um there there are things that make lots of tokens like jadar krim was talking about uh like the the flash raise the alarm guy like there's a lot of ways yep. to get around liliana to so that it's it's actually just a bad card that is i mean the, the main thing right like i mean i after after playing a lot of mono black i was like okay well i feel like th obviously it's a black base the standard so uh, i i started playing around with mono blue like and, and then i added black and i started playing with pop it stitcher and all this other stuff uh like the mono blue is like so good right now and and i am like in love with everything mono blue it's so good right now. You can pile drive children into not, the ground. <laughs> like four mana yeah, do nothing. Yeah. You're like Rona's vertex. <laughs> okay, <laughs> they kill you. <laughs> it was yeah. You it's know, kind I, of absurd. I don't think y'all are going to convince me that Mono Blue Curious Obsession, the return of Mono Blue Curious Obsession, is the the hero. It's we the hero. Need. We oh need. God, it's like going to play it. It's all like the, the most love annoying it. archetype. <laughs> oh my god! I got so many salty ropes like, to read oh. already. <laughs> Oh yeah! Oh, oh yeah! Oh, the archetypes. Oh, boy, ah, <laughs> give me. Okay. I'll play against Lillian all day before I got to play against a Curious Obsession. Counter all your stuff, deck. Oh, that deck's so obnoxious. But I do think it's good. Like I think you're right that that is a good counter to what's going on in the meta, and the counter spells are good, and your threats. I mean, Delver into Ledger Shredder into Haunted Gen. Like that's a pretty good creature base for a deck like that. And you got a uh, potentially upgraded Curious Obsession effect. So all the pieces are there. And the other thing that I think is going to make that deck maybe more popular than it should be on arena is you can put it together really cheap like if you go mono blue 
it's a it's a pretty budget friendly deck that also might actually be competitive which is similar to last time we had a mono blue curious obsession style list in standard like that was a legit top tier deck that was showing up at pro tours and it was something you could put together for like it's almost zero wild cards it was just everything's random common and uncommon counter spells and you have a couple of rare creatures and that's essentially the entire deck all right what do you guys think about uh the other jun deck the reanimator soul of wind grace titan of industry deck like if, if we're all talking like drilly mid-range this thing is supposed to go over the top of it right uh, I mean, Titan of Industry is very good. Like, yeah. Titan of Industry is is just a very, very strong card. I don't know. Like, I'm a little skeptical that two reanimation spells is going to be, like, enough to do it. I only see, like, two Diagraph Rebirths in the list. So I was wondering if you could build... Remember last time we had Liliana? The best Liliana shell, I think, was Solar Flare, which was Liliana with Unburial Rites. And yeah. you're pitching, like, Sun Titans to Liliana and reanimating Sun Titans and getting back Phantasmal Images. So I do think there's probably something there, although... I don't know. For me, this build looks looks more like it's trying to be a ramp deck than an actual yeah, reanimator it's a deck. Ramp which reanimator because Wind Grace ramps your lands in, right? So you can just Wind Grace into Titan of Industry. You don't need to randomly get them with the with the rebirth. I'm a little skeptical of Loam Speaker at the moment. Like that's the kind of card you don't want to play against Liliana. Like the the two drop that you want to stick out on the battlefield to ramp you, like. That's the, I want to play like spirited companions and things like that. He's like a oh, little value yes. two drops. And if you kill it, like, sure, whatever. Like you, you got it with Liliana. Like I win still. I don't know about the two mana mana dorks, but I like the idea of that deck. And I do love me some Titan of Industry. So I think something like someone's going to figure out how to make the reanimation. What if spirit work, companion had death touch, Seth? What about the Zer decks? <laughs> Ooh, have you seen it? I have not seen a single Zer. I, I brewed a couple of Zer decks. I haven't got a chance to play them because I've been playing other stuff. I haven't seen a single Zer like from an opponent either. Is is there a Zer deck that can actually do anything in standard? You think it is just? Well, I don't know how. Like it plays one Zer. I don't just don't know how it lives. Like it, <laughs> it's exactly what what black decks want to play against, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I ripped it apart when I played it. So I'm not sure what it was doing, but I saw a Zer in the list. <laughs> Like, like, yeah, you'll see Zer in the list. That, that's pretty cool. Does it do anything? Not really. So so is the answer so, just play whatever colors you want and then add black to it to <laughs> I, add the other 80% of your deck? You're like, I want to play Wedding Ring and then 95% black cards. <laughs> is, that, is this the answer? I, I mean, that is what current standard looks like. Yeah. Just based on these early results, that's pretty much what people are doing. But... Really, I, I that's not going to hold, right? Do, do we really think black is going to be anywhere near this dominant long term? Like, I'm skeptical. Personally, I'm skeptical that these early results are going to be representative of what we're seeing a month from now. I hope it's not what we're seeing a month from now. Like, I I don't want to see any card at like 70% of the meta. That's You're getting up to, to Oko numbers there. If you you have cards that are at 70%. It's week so one. I, I, I don't think it'll stay. It is. Yeah, but you, yeah. So usually week Hopefully. one is a lot more aggressive. It's like shocking that everyone's decided to go dirtily black. And everyone has just ended up here. But we'll see how it turns out. We literally have like four tournaments on the site or something. Not that many. And one standard challenge. Yeah. Yeah, we'll be getting a lot more in the future. Like, got to remember this hat like, doesn't even officially release in paper, I don't think, until Friday. So we, we got some time. We just had pre-release in paper. But uh, I've been really enjoying standard. I know it's yeah, there's a lot of black decks, but I think there's still a ton to explore and a ton to... Uh, a ton to work on, really. So I, I'm excited to see where Seth, standard Seth, I, I need to here, cheat really. and jump ahead to Fishmail from Kiwi Doc, who identified okay. a fourth place list from the standard challenge. Fourth place, so top four. Rakdos Sacrifice. <laughs> I know where this is. <laughs> Play two card living legacies. <laughs> Are we wrong? What? Is uh, card legit? You just the, make Power no, Stones and the, sack them to Anvil? Is this what we're they, doing? <laughs> they... I, I'm pretty sure they would have won the champ. Yeah, yeah. Those two cards for literally any other you got card. card flooded and lost. Is that, is that what happened? Yeah. yeah, that that had to have been what it was. I I mean I I'm still not buying it. Like looking at the deck list, there are synergies for Karn. So if there was ever a deck that could take advantage of like making a power zone token, it's something that can sack that token to Oni called Anvil or whatever. So there are synergies there, but. I don't think it's good enough. I still don't think it's good enough. So <laughs> know, I'm, sticking, I'm sticking with across the finish line. Yeah. Is that what you're pretty talking? much. <laughs> it shows that you, you can play yeah. anything. You can play, as long as you play you Liliana. Pitch the card to the Lily and it's like good, right? Like that's that's the whole idea. Yeah, I mean, you got Fable the Mirror Breaker too. So you got tons of ways to, to I guess, make Karn good by discard, discarding it for value. So 
<laughs> Good for scrying to the bottom when you mulligan. Yeah, There's yeah. all kinds of yeah, synergies I... in standard. <laughs> Uh, all right. Any other standard uh, thoughts before we talk a little bit about older formats? We've already seen a bit of a bit of an impact from Dominator United there as well. Oh, I, I just want to say that don't worry about Lily. So I was surprised that there's no obstinate Bailoff in the format. And uh, if, if Lily gets a little gross, like Watsi can just shoehorn that into the next uh, 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 the, ne- the next set, and then your Lily is so sad <laughs> when you plus one and a Bayloth comes down, or a was like Wilt Leaf Champion or whatever. Like so, uh, Orvar. We just lost yeah. Orvar had the same ability, so yeah, they could put something like that. And really, like like you said before. Uh, so okay, the upside is you can beat Liliana. You mentioned that before. Like if you build your deck to minimize impact to Liliana, there are the pieces to do that really easily. The problem is, I don't think Liliana's the reason black is yeah. good. Like, Liliana's a good piece in the deck, but the black shell in general is just really, really strong. It was like, me and Krim were talking about Pioneer uh, the other day about, about Rakdos and Pioneer and how Rakdos has been really dominant and it's getting Liliana, which should make it even better. And we were like, let's say this deck's a problem. How do you actually deal with it? Like, what, what are you going to ban? Fatal push? Yeah. Like, what what kind of, like, there's just nothing yeah. in this deck because it's just a whole bunch of, like, really good above the curve cards, like a Jun style deck. I think that's kind of how black is in standard, too. Like, you make Liliana bad. I think the rest of the deck is still strong enough that that's fine, which is maybe why you don't build specifically to be Liliana because then you're still going to get got by Graveyard Trespassers and Sorens and Shieldreds and all the other really strong black cards. So it'll be interesting to see how it shakes out because even if you deleted Liliana altogether, I think black is still like the best color at the moment in standard. By the far, only yeah. Is fast combo. <laughs> Bring back Nexus of That's Fate with this reclamation. <laughs> oh my god. That's how you beat this. Like every card <laughs> like one Nessie. for twos you with that black shell, right? So you just be like, whatever, dude. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna cobble off. <laughs> Richard is constructing like my literal nightmare standard mono blue tempo <laughs> versus Nexus Wilderness Wreck. It is. I don't want, I w- I'd rather play Meat Hook Massacre Mirror Matches for the rest of my life, I think, than deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> I I'm I, I genuinely think mono blue just beats a lot of the the decks that are out there in in standard, but it, it, like I I do wonder now about Pioneer, right? Like like we we were talking about that. I we haven't seen anything yet, but I'm curious. Like, are, are you concerned for Pioneer? So we have Pioneer results. So we got we got our first Pioneer Challenge results, and predictably, it was Rakdos that uh, that took it down. Uh, Rakdos has already been the best deck in the format. It gets Liliana added in. Uh, Liliana had a pretty big impact. I believe it was one of the one of the top ten most played spells out of the top thirty two. Twenty five percent of decks were uh, were playing Liliana, which. Is a lot, but at the same time, Rakdos was already like 25% of the meta or something. So just like slotting, slotting it into Rakdos and Pioneer is going to give you some pretty big numbers. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Like, even if that deck is a problem, I don't know how you deal with the problem. Like, that's the, that's the issue. It's just a pile of good cards and I don't know how you would ever ban it. So I think Liliana does improve that deck, but overall, like, maybe you do the same thing. Like, we saw multiple Mono Blue Spirit decks also be like in the top 16. So maybe, maybe you go on that same game plan of just like play your little blue things and counter everything your opponent does. And like, uh, maybe Liliana just can't beat that. But they attack your hand so much better in Pioneer because of thought sees all the things, right? Yeah. Yes, have, that they is they have that the is true. which makes it have game against everything. Like, are, are, do we not yeah. have any fast enough combo decks in Pioneer yet? Uh, there's uh, the Pioneer. Like, I guess it depends on what you think of the the ramp decks that are kind of combo decks now like the mono green devotion combo finish decks but we don't really have a, a any top tier spell based combo decks the ones that were like kind of good like lotus field combo have really fallen off recently and don't really show up anymore this, this is yeah this is the problem with like power creeping mid-range value creatures <laughs> like they, they just take over the game without any combo but wizards isn't printing combo pieces into pioneer so interesting to see where that goes yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm not overly concerned about Pioneer at this point. Give it, I, I don't think it's even that bad. Like, Rakdos is very good, but to me, it's not that much different than when Blue White was the best deck six months ago or whatever. Like, I, I don't view Pioneer as a broken format by any stretch, and I still usually have fun when I play it. And I don't know, at least if you're losing to Rakdos, it's kind of a real game of magic. <laughs> <laughs> like, as far as decks to lose, <laughs> it's, 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 it's
but I can, I don't know, for some reason I can handle losing mid-range battles, like, those are some of the, like, least, least offensive ways to lose for me, personally, like, even if you're getting crushed, it doesn't, it feels like you're still playing to some extent, at least that's how I feel when I play those decks. <laughs> really? I think it's the illusion that you're playing. <laughs> I've seen a lot of scoops to Lily in my games, <laughs> where you just play Lily, minus any scoop, then I can't beat it. <laughs> this card's unbeatable. This is the greatest yeah, card. I've I mean, because I mean, sometimes like it actually is unbeatable <laughs> for your deck, right? If you don't have the right cards in hand or you didn't draw the right thing, it's unbeatable. Uh, but I, I think we're gonna get a new, you know, a new era of mid-range saltiness. Like people that are salty over like Deathrite Shaman, like Jace the Mind Sculptor. <laughs> a new era of salty. <laughs> yeah, like before you're just salty about <laughs> combo decks, right? Now you can be salty by mid-range. I guess we have that from Oko, right? It's like it's just a bit. You just play it Oko, like I scoop. Uro, I scoop, right? Like, is Lily the next thing for standard players? Just don't even bother I, I, fighting through it. <laughs> I don't even think Lily I mean, is like that busted in standard. No, I mean, so but I'm just saying that people are scooping to it prematurely, like this, like this right? Salt scoop, which right? yeah, which is surprising. Which is why I'm like, wait, why though? I think people just salt scoop anyways, right? Like, I can't imagine what, like why people will salt like what people would like salt scoop to right imagine jace the mind sculptor standard <laughs> all right uh i mean how much of it do you think is just people need to learn how to play against lily like lily is like i don't know we all play a lot of modern and have for a long time so we all have a lot of experience but like working against lily but maybe yeah. arena players or even pioneer players just like haven't had that experience if they're not modern players or weren't playing standard over a decade ago last time liliana was around so i wonder how much of that'll just change as people learn how to play yeah. against give, the give them a month because it is a planeswalker you it, can it's play not against. until yeah. you like ultimate lily and then lose the game still like having complete control yeah. because they just play like a single jace the mind sculptor and like that undid like five turns <laughs> worth of work then, then they'll realize that you could just sit there outlast lily if you have like the right cards in hand or in your deck uh, yeah. okay wait okay let's go to the format where lily is bad and see what dominaria united did to it modern Seth, okay. I believe the first place deck has yes. some DMU cards. Yes, we were we were debating the Lords last podcast, which one would be best, and the early results here suggest that it's going to be Run Velt Horde Master we, Goblins. Goblins there's came no in debate. and took down there's no debate the entire the entire tournament. Hey, you were on Team Murfolk. No, no, no. I I, I, I think I think Murfolk is very very much so awesome, but Goblins is better. Goblins is better. Yeah. So Goblins Goblins got there, playing four Runvelt Horde Masters, kind of similar to the builds that we've seen in the past, where you have the Snoop combo going on, you get the Sacrifice stuff with Skirk Prospectors and Mog Fanatics that work really well with Runvelt Horde Master. And if you look at the rest of <laughs> this metagame, there's a lot of Fury still. Like, it, it's still that kind of stuff going on. Maybe it really is that Horde Master and its ability to let you kind of refuel once you get your board fury, uh, furied away. Maybe that is going to give Goblins a chance to actually compete with these Modern Horizons 2 cards. Again, like, super early results. It's one event. But that's a big takeaway. I, I don't know. Was there anything else from Dominator United that really showed up in this top 32 that any of you have found? Uh, let me see here. Nothing that really like surprises me right like i think er everything that we we kind of expected showed up right yeah i mean so I mean, it's it's, <sighs> it's the typical very super diverse modern metagame actually if you look at the top eight they're all unique decks except for an extra copy of hammer time it's goblins glimpse belcher living End, hammer time affinity rakdos and then hammer time then murktide so i i think yeah. I think this is good, right? It just made Goblin a more legitimate deck, and then it just fits in with the rest of the modern metagame. Oh, yeah. Goblins is not going to be <laughs> problematic, I wouldn't say, for uh, the modern metagame, but maybe it will be, again, a, a top-tier deck because of that. I guess the other card that we did see make an immediate impact, which is one we had talked about during like our top 10 list, uh, Leyline Binding. Which yeah. Is really, really good in the Cascade decks because it gives you often a one mana removal spell that isn't going to mess with your violent outbursts or whatever. So we see like uh, the glimpse combo deck that finished second playing a full play set of Leyline Binding. So that's the other card that I think has made just a, an immediate impact on the format. Anyway, I guess that's a, uh, I guess that's Dominator United and constructed. It'll be interesting to see where we go from here. Any other thoughts on DMU constructed before we hit up some other topics? Arita did it die. All right. <laughs> Are yeah. Oh, Arena launched. <laughs> oh, like, yes. 
and worked. Shout out to Wizards. Shout out to Wizards. This was the smoothest launch that I remember, like, in years. Like, I'm always skeptical. Rotation, new set patch. Normally, that means I'm playing Moto for my Thursday night stream because <laughs> Arena's just not functioning. This time... It didn't even struggle. Arena just kind of crushed it. So hopefully this is a, a sign of things to come for patches on Arena because this one worked incredibly well. So yeah, shout out to Wizards and the Arena team. Uh, they definitely killed it with with whatever they did with this patch not being like normal. All right, so we got we got a couple other topics. One I want to mention just really quick is we got our Q4 Judge promos, uh, which are Perforos, God of the Forge, and Animate Dead. I mostly wanted to mention it because the anime dead looks oh, so yeah, it's, sweet. It looks the, like the a old border an dinosaur skeleton. <laughs> oh, oh, it looks so it looks awesome. That's uh, oh, such a sweet looking anime dead. So uh, those will be going out to judges in a few months. But the other topic, Krim, I know you brought this one up. Magic might have some uh, some competition in the near future. Y Who is making a competing card game? So you might have heard of a small indie company called Disney. Um. So, small indie company Disney is looking to drop a new game called Lorcana. Uh, we don't know too much about it. We haven't seen anything yet, but they have mentioned it is a like not a digital card game. Disney's launching a new game to go up against Magic and Pokemon. Now, if there is a company to have the resources to help launch a game, with, like it would be small indie company Disney, right? I mean, come on, the, like they, this is kind of interesting. This might actually be like a good game when you think about it because like they have all the ips you could want right like they have they have like all the princesses they have marvel they have star wars so there's very much so a chance that there's randomly like a, a an elsa verse like iron man meta right like and and uh, yeah sure like maybe i'm this decreases my chances of getting my marvel secret layer but like they've got the ips to back it up and, you know, if they get a good game design coming out of this, it, this could be a real thing. It, I mean, like, hmm. I, it, of all the companies to make a game, like, I don't know, though, because, like, we don't know how Disney does when it comes to games, right? Like, like when I think of, like, game companies or card games in any way, shape, or form, I'm not exactly thinking about Disney. Like, if Valve couldn't do it, right, with Artifact, granted that Artifact was a digital, uh, maybe, like... Disney can do it, but I, I don't know. I mean, we'll have to see if, like, this, like any other card game, gets past, like, the two-year, three-year mark. Uh, I, I think few games have, like, hit that mark. I think right now all I can think of is, like, maybe Flesh and Blood. But, like, this is, I think, one of the, one of the companies that could make something happen. Yeah. So, obviously, like, they got the money. Disney got the money. Even compared to Hasbro or Wizards, like, Disney, Disney has way more money than them. On the other hand, like, they say they're competing with Magic, but then if you actually read the article announcing this, they talked about not being, like, super competitive. They want people to, like, have fun with the characters they love. We've pulled back on the confrontation level to try to appeal to more folks. But uh, So I wonder if this is actually, like, designed to compete with Magic in the sense of being, like, a competitive strategic game, or if this is going to be, like, I don't know, a little kid's, like have fun with your Disney character type of thing. Like, uh, I, uh, maybe? Like, so, uh, I, don't know. I think Wizards just kind of shot themselves in the foot, right? So the way they position, they're positioning this is like, not so serious, for fun, you know, play your Spider-Man versus Iron Man versus Darth Vader stuff, right? And guess what the most popular segment in Magic is today? EDH players with their universes beyond yep. Secret Lair. Right. So I don't think this is any threat to, you know, spike magic, right? Like if you're playing a PTQ, like you're not going to care about this. But if you're a casual person, if you're like just collecting Pokemon cards, you don't even know how to play the game. You're just like, I want a shiny Bulbasaur, right? I want a shiny Darth Vader, right? I want a new secret layer Elsa or something. Like I think this directly competes, right? And it will take away EDH players and it will cut into your universes beyond, right? Uh, I, I fail to see why there would ever be a universes beyond Doctor Strange or something now, right? Like they'll just put it in their own game. And this is kind yeah, of a Netflix yeah. problem, right? Like the, the, the biggest criticism of universes beyond was not the other IP. It was that Magic was not investing in its own IP 
And when these other companies realize that you can just print millions of dollars by making four pieces of cardboard, they'll just do their own, right? And that's the problem Netflix has, right? All the good shows are going off Netflix and now there's like 20,000 streaming services. This could be a problem, right? Like, you know, Disney, Marvel, Star Wars. That's that's a huge, huge IP, right? They're going to have right. their own card game now. We're definitely and- not getting universes beyond. I, I I think that if if we are getting universes beyond, it's definitely not going to be the ones that you know like it, they've Disney's got a chunk of the IPs here, so I'm just curious what they could do, like what like what the new secret layers are going to look like. Appealing to ca- the casual like demographic is exactly what you want to do, right? I mean the the like Pokemon is the one card game that I love to death, but like let's be honest. It's entirely casual. No one actually plays it. Everybody collects it. So that's why I think this is a brilliant move for them. They aren't going to try to be competitive. A lot of games start off as trying to appeal to the casual crowd and then eventually could develop a competitive scene. So I kind of like that move. So uh, when I think of Disney, I think of like movies I watched when I was five years old. (laughs) Like I think of Disney as little kid stuff. Is that not the proper perception of Disney in 2022? Like, Disney it, it, is Disney Marvel more than that? Wars, yeah. So your 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 X Men comics and <laughs> TV shows, you know, like the okay, biggest okay. blockbuster movies, like all of like the Avengers and Marvel arcs and all the Marvel TV shows, all of that, right? And then the resurgence of Star Wars IP, and you know what? Disney's not done. Take whatever favorite yeah. IP you have; they're probably gonna buy it next year. <laughs> right yeah. so like disney's not done right they bought marvel they bought star wars and those two things are hugely successful like after disney bought it right to the to the chagrin of like old time fans right so they, they, they'll they just keep buying stuff and they'll just keep adding to it and i i'm concerned but do you think like i, I think if you're a new you kid gonna... like a kid today or like a, a young teen or a young adult and you wanted to play with your favorite characters like chances are they're disney characters and not Jay Spellerin. Yeah. But don't you outgrow? I don't know. Okay. Maybe, maybe having like Star Wars and X-Men changes that. I imagine like, I don't know. I just have a hard time imagining like someone in college going to their LGS and playing Sleeping Beauty versus Snow White versus Elsa oh, you or play something. Darth like, Vader. That just, <laughs> yeah. And you have but then, Iron Man. You, play you have Iron like Wolverine. Man, Spider-Man. But are you going to have the same issue that Secret Lair Drops have where, like, well, my opponents are playing that? Even if you build this sweet Dark Vader deck, if you sit down against someone playing Princess right, Tribal, right. like, I'll, I'll counter you, really you think with it's two very popular to gamers? gamers that have proven that this works. Well, three, actually. So Fortnite, where you're like Ariana Grande versus The Rock versus, like, Goku from Dragon okay. Ball, right? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. You have Smash Brothers, which is, like, literally any character in the <laughs> Nintendo adjacent universe fighting each other across like you know every single dimension possible and you have an yeah. old school favorite marvel versus capcom right? oh yeah Where it's just like look resident evil person versus like ryu versus wolverine so like these crossover things are actually kind of popular so so yes there will be a sleeping beauty right just like when you play smash brothers you're you're playing like um you know fox versus peach or something right like yeah but You'll, you'll be like, oh, she's so badass and cool, whatever, right? And then, like, let's just imagine if Liliana was a, a Disney princess. Would it change your perception of standard? It's, they're basically the same. <laughs> I mean, that's true. Although, I will say, one thing all those games have going for them is the gameplay is really fun. And we yeah. don't know anything about Lord yeah. gameplay at this point. Like, is this going to actually be something that's uh, engaging enough gameplay wise? Like, regardless, like delete the characters and all that. Magic has a very good gaming system. That's that's part of what we've seen with the shift to secret layer drops. Is Wizards wants to be more of like just a set of rules that you can put all these different characters and IPs onto, rather than be its own universe. It, will the gameplay actually hold up to what people are expecting to be something that's going to keep you coming back and playing? They're partnering with Ravensburger, which is a company I never heard of, so I looked them up. I and buy their puzzles. They make like puzzles <laughs> yeah. and like yeah, puzzles is one of their big things, and their their games look like mostly little kids games, honestly, like Funny Bunny, Teddy Mix and Match. Those are like their award winning games. So 
is this company going to be able to make something on the level of Magic or Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh that is like that engaging gameplay wise? I think that's probably the the million dollar question. Like, is this game actually good or is it just trying to get carried by the IPs, which Disney obviously has some of the most popular IPs in the world? So I mean, we've be carried by IP. And you need to make cards that don't curl. And there's a, that's what Ravensburger is for, right? Like a 139-year-old game publisher who knows how to print cardboard. Can you make foily cards that don't turn into Pringles? Like, that's what they need to solve. And I think they can do it. I think they can do it. What do you think, Grim? I, I mean, like, the the one thing that I, I really like about it is that I don't even know if the gameplay has to be great when your IPs are so popular. Like, like there are some games that you've just seen do well, regardless how the gameplay is, right? Like, for a while, like, Yu-Gi-Oh! might have had, like, some of the most questionable gameplay. <laughs> or, 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 like, yeah, Pokemon as well. And people, like, Pokemon, again, is proof that, like, if you just have, like, a popular IP, it doesn't matter. Like, people love Pokemon. Yeah. Just, just look at all the bad yeah, mobile I guess games that's... with IP slapped on it. It still makes so much money. People just want to uh, drop like 50 bucks, play with their favorite characters, and then just never see it again, right? They're not looking for a 10-year PTQ grind into the Hall of Fame, right? They're just like, right. let me let me play some <laughs> Spider-Man to get on with my life, right? Yeah, I mean, I guess that's true. Although still, like, if the game's not good, you're not going to win over Magic players, oh, yeah, I don't think. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, I mean, like, do I think this will actually kill Magic? No. But, like, I do think that it is possible to now have, a, like, a new game to coexist with Magic. Uh, and, and, like, if there is a new title to enter and, like, maybe be, like, a, what you call, like, a big, big four now at this point, uh, it, it could be this. It'll be interesting because they seem to be going, like, the last paper trading card game to actually kind of make it, it seems like, is maybe Flesh and Blood. And it seems like this Disney game is going completely the opposite direction. Like, Flesh and Blood is way more spiking and tournament focused than Magic, even. And, like, very much about the, like, competitive aspect of it. It seems like Disney's going the very other direction. So, uh, it'll be interesting to see how that actually works. I, they obviously have a huge leg up just by being Disney and having their IP. So, I guess we'll find out more in the future. It sounds like the first sets are supposed to release... The end of 2023. So we got a, a year to go, although we should get some uh, some spoilers ahead of time, it sounds Lord like. Lorcana spoilers start season about starts it. next week. Oh, yeah. <laughs> more, it it says can, that uh, at the D23 uh, Expo in Anaheim, the fan-focused event kicks off September 9th, where we'll get a first look at the cards. So... Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll that'll be interesting. Like. We will we'll report back once we see the cards. We'll report back with our with our updated opinions on this game. But well, let us know what you think. If you're listening to this someplace where there's comments, I'm curious. Do you view this new Lorcana game as a is something that could end up on Magic's level? So, what we what we do anyway, is IP I that think, Seth likes that Disney could potentially buy, and then he'll be all aboard. Yeah. What would that be, Seth? Uh, 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 like old obscure the, the, bands, I guess. Uh, the Buffalo a, Bills. A, a the Buffalo Jack. Bills. Did, <laughs> Disney just yeah. only buys the Buffalo Bills. <laughs> Honestly, like, oh. oh, I still don't know if that would win me over, but maybe that would give him a shot. Give, give me some BoJack cards. And uh, oh my god, I got a we'll Josh go Allen there. card. Yes. <laughs> I think don't they already make sports cards though? I think someone beat him to to the Josh Allen cards. <laughs> Maybe you're right. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway, any other thoughts on any of this stuff, I guess. Those were our big topics. Maybe it's fish mail time if no one has anything else. I'm good. All right. Well and Richard. I guess fish mail. All right. If you have questions, send them to at MG Goldfish with the hashtag MG Fish Mail, and we'll get to your questions on air. Uh, Mojas, in a commander game, do you think it's scummy to reveal private information you know about a player to the whole table, such as the top card of a player's library or a card in a player's hand? Ooh, no, not, well, I don't know. I never really thought hard about this, but I know when we play, we usually reveal that information. Like if someone sees someone's hand, I've seen people go both ways, but I think it's more common that we do reveal that information if someone asks, so... Have we just been being scummy this whole time? I think it's fine. Yeah, I, I, I don't I don't see the issue in it. Yeah, I assume if someone sees my hand, the whole table sees my hand. And I think sometimes we don't reveal it, but that's 
for the benefit of the person who has the information because they think we can get more out of it. But I don't yeah. see us coming. But maybe I guess I can see why because like those people are not supposed to know this information. Um, I think it is scummy if you're like dead and then you reveal. <laughs> Like you go see people's hands and then like tell like what's in their head. That's weird, right? Like oh when yeah, you're, yeah. When you're that, part of the game different. and you got that information legitimately. I I think it's fair game. Would you feel differently if it wasn't our Commander Clash play group? Like if you were just playing with three randoms at uh, how about Vegas Magic Thirty in Vegas? Would you feel differently if someone like oh, whatever Gitaxi probed you and then just shouted out your hand to everyone? No, not really. I mean, I don't I don't see the issue. Plus, right. plus half these cards yeah, like, I mean, do I that anyway, so I don't know. Like some cards like don't reveal, uh, but some like reveal to the table. I think is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I don't know. Yeah, I think it's fine. Uh, but of all jokes, you've had a lot of discussions about the saltiest cards and most unfun cards to play against a commander. How do you feel about aura shards and grave pact? Uh, they just feel so often lead to locking specific archetypes out of the game. Crib loves great. Those packs. specific archetypes should. Uh, <laughs> those specific archetypes should probably play some enchantment. Yeah, yeah. Table. <laughs> Problem solved. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't think I. I care at all about any of that. I can see aura shard. Like aura shards can be a blowout. It is. It is very good, but it's only blowing up artifacts and enchantments. Like, is it really that much different than a bane of progress or something? So, I don't know. I. I don't think of those cards as especially salty personally. Yeah, I mean, yeah. They're, they're just very powerful and like aura shards is like a rest in peace right it's like it just keeps giving right like you blow out all the stuff on the board and then no one can play until you remove it so i can see why people get salty over it but i don't know it's just removal you need to interact with it and it's like super slow it requires them to play a lot of creatures so like i don't think it's that oppressive it's just if you don't like it then you need a way to deal with it in your deck and you should probably be playing that anyway. And that's why cards like Beast Within or those flexible removal spells, Assassin's Trophy that we always talk about are like so valuable is they give your deck a way to deal with, you know, an annoying aura shards that comes down or a grave pack or whatever other thing might be troubling your deck. So I think that's part of the reason that flexible removal just has so much value in uh, in Commander. Uh, DTN Pleb Nation with all the chatter about Phyrexian mana. What if it instead of life, it gave you X poison counters? There could be an argument for how many times you could cast it or risk losing the game. Ooh. It needs to give you like hmm. six poison counters. <laughs> Otherwise, it's a strict upgrade, yeah. I would say. <laughs> yeah, if it if it was a low number, that would be so much more broken in most decks, I think. Although I guess there's not a way to really remove poison counters, at least not many ways to remove poison counters. So maybe that would be... In upside, like with Phyrexian mana, you can always gain life. There's tons of ways to gain life. But I would think unless it was giving you a lot of poison counters, it would just be even more broken Phyrexian mana in a lot of formats. What's the correct number, you think? <sighs> so so if it, it's two life, which is... So it's just uh, what, one 10% poison? 10% of your life total. <laughs> <laughs> so one yeah, poison yeah, yeah. would be... The, the problem <laughs> is, though, like if you go back to modern or something and you're not playing against an infect deck, your life total is under pressure from lightning bolts and your opponent's creatures, but your infect counters are not. I think it'd have to be, uh, it'd have to be more. It'd have to be at least double. Double what? And maybe that like would four? even be two. Double, yeah, it'd have to be like, well, like two infect counters. That's still so free. <laughs> five That's so yeah, free. Yeah. In mana. Yeah. <laughs> is that I, I would free? play just members <sighs> left and right if, if that was the case. Uh, all right. Three, then you get three. Then you could cast three Phyrexian. Use three Phyrexian mana symbols before you died. Uh, uh -huh. I guess that's like that. Actually, does feel like a cost. That would that would add up at least. I mean, if you go to five, you could cast literally one spell. That's too many. So it's got to be like three to four. Then I guess. Do you want him to cast three, <laughs> three Phyrexian mana infect spells or two Phyrexian mana infect spells? I think that's. That's kind of the cutoff. I guess five. If it's two infect counters, you could guess five spells. That's probably two free. So I, I guess three or so four. So if it was five, five you couldn't cast a dismember. You would die. So, you would die, so, yeah. it, it, so then that would just be bad. Yeah, so you you wouldn't run. What, what other, like, Phyrexian mana spells do we actually have that are playable? Like, would, would we uh, unban uh, Get Probe we or something if we did this? Yeah, Get Probe or... No. Oh, that would... Oh, not in modern. That's the other <laughs> challenge is a lot of these cards would Got be shot. fine in standard, I think. 
But in modern, they would be so busted. Like, that would be a Gitaxian probe that caused Fraxium, and it would be pretty strong. Although, I guess, like, it makes multiples worse, too. Hmm. But again, if, if, if I can cast one three, if I get probe, three, your second one mana a game, I would snap take that for whatever poison, right? And then if yeah, you, yeah, if, yeah. If you, like, I don't know, get me with that Phyrexian Crusader that you got me, right? But, like, <laughs> like I feel that's just, like, three free mana to start the game. That's, like, triple Lotus Petal. I'll take that, right? At no cost. Yeah, 100%. So I think it has to be four or five or something. Like, maybe four, you get, like, one Dismember off. And then you gotta pay mana. Would you still just play Dismember everywhere if you it was four? <laughs> Funny enough, yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah, right. Because that 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 four life yeah. is a lot, right? In in modern, right? Because uh, especially when you're bringing Dismember against like aggressive decks, like it is like so painful. Yeah, that's that's true. Although it'd be a lot worse with Death Shadow. Mm-hmm. Oh mm-hmm. yeah, can't have <laughs> Shadow of Mortality, <laughs> Death Shadow. <Yeah>. Oh. <laughs> All right, four. I'll go with four. I think four. Let's let's go with four. Yeah, I I think four actually makes like makes sense. Like it's just three is like not enough, right? It's just like yeah, it's a little bit of a cost, but not to where like I actually have to think about it. Two two doesn't even count. Yeah, two two is free. (laughs) Two is a free roll. (laughs) You might as well. We we don't even talk about one. Yeah, (laughs) may as well just give it like if it's your first spell this turn, it's free. You know, may as well make it that. Oh, also, also, someone literally just tweeted this at me, and I guess it's not technically fish mail, but I think it should count as fish mail, which is um, the the Elish Norn quote unquote leak, which uh, is not actually a real magic card. Uh, I, I don't know if either of you saw this over the weekend, but uh, it's a three mana two four with vigilance that when another creature enters the battlefield under your control, creatures you control get plus one plus one, and when your opponent's creatures enter the battlefield, their creatures get negative one negative one. Uh, 100% fake. So if you're someone who was wondering about this card or saw it going around, uh, it is definitely not a not a real card. I, uh, the set number doesn't really line up. The font doesn't really look right. The photo is way too crisp. Uh, so everything about it, especially on the back of having the fake shield rid come out like a, just before DMU. So if you see that going around, uh, I'm like 99.9% sure it's it's not real. So. Yeah, I, I saw that, and I, I think, like, <laughs> yeah, like, I'm like, I don't even understand what the point of, like, making these fakes are. It's like, got them, everybody. They thought it was real. <laughs> yeah, you get your ratted up votes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, that's MTG so sick. finance play. You, like, stock up on something that would go well with it, release the fake, get the ratted up votes. Ooh. <laughs> uh, all right, last question. G Sans. Sigilo. The much a brew deck that Saf built, Goyf, but in standard is pretty strong. I've been winning nonstop since crafting it. Do you think Saltai Creature Graveyard will be a strong deck in the upcoming standard? So I think the problem is probably Graveyard Hate. The deck is so de- I think the deck is very strong, but the deck is very dependent on the graveyard. And there is enough graveyard hate in standard that if the deck ever did become very strong, it would be pretty easy to hate out of the meta. So I feel like it's one of those decks that if people aren't playing graveyard hate, you can do really well with. Or if you're playing best of one, where it's a lot harder to play like narrow sideboard graveyard hate cards in your main deck, you can probably do pretty well with it there as well. As far as being like top tier and best of three overall, that's where I'm just like a little skeptical because I feel like if it ever did get good, you're just going to get oh, you're going to see so much graveyard hate and it's going to wreck you because it's almost like modern reg or something where if your graveyard gets wiped <laughs> one time, it slows you down so much that it's very difficult to actually rebuild and get back in the game. So is it, that would be my concern. Is it time to say dredge has a new toy? Is, is Has it been declared yet that dredge has a new toy? I I, I don't think the new Goyf will make it in Modern Dredge, but I do think the, like, Dredgeless Dredge decks and Pioneer will play it. I, I That's actually a deck I'm excited to try, because they play a lot of creatures, and they fill the graveyard, so I think it could be pretty good in a deck like that. But yeah, a little a little slow for Modern Dredge, probably. Wait, so Dredge does not have a new toy. Is that enough to stop the deck? 
Graveyard Trespasser is not is not really enough, I okay. don't think. Because the deck is pretty good at filling the graveyard. But there are what is it, Lantern of the Lost? There's like a one mana artifact that like draws you a card and you can sack it to exile the graveyards. Like stuff like that gets you real good. Or if you run into like if someone draws a bunch of graveyard trespassers and adds in like Cemetery Prowler is a card that I've seen show up a little bit. Like those other those other like incidental graveyard taste spells. If someone just overloads on that, it can get you. Otherwise, you're really mostly afraid of like the hard wipe that gets your entire graveyard at once <laughs> Fair, farewell like shadow realms you like permanently right <laughs> oh farewell like, <laughs> Just oh yeah like like <laughs> oh i would i yes. would open a bug report if someone casted farewell on me like like sorry arena your game's broken i just got farewelled and lost have have you tried the goif at all richard in your standard journeys no, it looks so sad i didn't know yo but I, I played a game and all i did was just bounced the goif and killed him <laughs> Like, they're like five man <laughs> okay, or four yeah. man or whatever. I'm like, okay, cool. I just hit you with my Delver. Cool. Uh, but it seems so sad. Like, do we want to try with Liliana and have Liliana carry? <laughs> you, you said it has to be a creature, gotta, right? It has really to be a six finger it. Goyf deck, right? Yeah. Yeah, you really got to go heavy on creatures to make it work. We tried uh, during early access day playing like normal Jund with it, and oh, it was so bad. It made real Goyf look good, actually. <laughs> like, it made me wish for like actual Tarmogoyf for the first time in quite a few years. So. I definitely played it with like a reanimator deck, and it was, it was like, it wasn't great. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. Yeah, it just doesn't get big enough. Although, you know what I did find is the the ooze that triggers like Goyf is pretty sweet in that deck. I think that card's actually like kind of good. Then maybe that'll see more play after there's, rotation there's a ooze if a graveyard that's deck. Goyf? Yeah, it's only your graveyard, but yeah, it's a, a five minute ooze that's Tarmogoyf for your graveyard, and then it makes a copy of itself on the end step. So you get oh, two Goyfs for five, five mana. Is not yeah. Game is over. <laughs> <laughs> But two, you get two of them. So it's like, you know, if you do the math, it's like two and a half mana for each of them. I actually <laughs> want to go full boomer. There's a there's a Thrag Tusk. It's like five five mana or whatever. And then it leaves a 4-4 four, four Rhydo. Uh, and then you can keep blitzing Ooh. it. Oh, like, that's quite obnoxious. Yeah. That, that, that's, uh, yeah. Lily can't keep up with that either. So you can go full boomer and play Thrag Tusk, which was the bane of Liliana during the, that actual standard, right? Oh, actually, one one more standard question before we wrap this up. Have you guys seen Defilers at all? No, I feel no. like I, I don't know if I played <laughs> against a single Defiler. Oh. I think I saw one mono red Defiler deck, but like really, they, it's like they don't even exist. I, I've seen them and they've all just gotten answered immediately. <laughs> like, maybe because I also just bounced them back. Rona's Vortex. And then I just like, OK, you're, what are you doing? <laughs> like that. That was about it. Can, can you pay? Yeah, they did for disappointed me like. I've seen people, I've seen the green one cast, but they just passed the turn and I didn't understand. You can only pay one. You can use the Frexing discount for one mana symbol per card. Yeah. So if you got a double green spell, it can reduce it by one, but not both. So yeah, it makes it a little it, harder it to go off with. And even if you untap successfully, you don't even necessarily win with it. So <laughs> Yeah. And, and those are the kind of cards that do line up kind of bad with Liliana. It's like, hey, my big thing that does nothing. You're like, oh, <laughs> take down Liliana. <laughs> yep. I think Shouldred's bad. People love Shouldred, but I'm like, yeah, Shouldred people is love so Shouldred. Easy oh, to like get like blown it. out with that. I refuse to believe this is like a real thing. I I don't know. I mean, like, she's, I thought Shouldred's good. She's okay. Like, she's not like the like. I'll admit, I was a little low on her. Like, I don't think she's like the absolute worst thing, but I don't know. It doesn't so seem she that sticks, great either, dead, right? But. Yeah, yeah, but sure. But you have, like, a turn or two to answer it, and then, you, you know, you can answer it quite easily <laughs> without taking anything from it, right? So, like, I'd rather just play a Soren or something in that slot and just make some vampires or draw more cards than children. So, I don't know. I've been abusing children I mean, I think with Mono Blue, but <laughs> I, I, people seem to be really high in the card, and, and sometimes it does take over the game, but I refuse to believe this is a thing. I, I will admit. Well, I mean, I think uh, uh, Mono Blue lines up super well with any removal, like, right? Like your you four mana, right? Or yeah. something and, like call it a day, right? My blue black control deck was just like that's a very nice card. All right, I'm gonna kill it. <laughs> <laughs> eh, 
I don't know. I still find it to be pretty powerful. I, I've i gotten stuck behind Shieldred a couple of times playing where you get low on life and it yeah. comes down and you're just like, oh, I just like I, I can't kill it. And now I'm like literally dead. And it's very good against Agra. I've been working on a mono oh, yeah, yeah. for budget magic. And uh, Shieldred is like my worst, my worst nightmare if you're trying to play some sort of mono red deck. Like even just coming down for a turn or two, like the life is so brutal if you're trying to be aggro. I think that's one of the most hilarious things about like 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 aggro right now. There's just so many things without even trying. They just take a dump on aggro. Yeah, you you just play your red one drops and you pray that there's no me hook massacre. That is, that is my experience playing for and you're please come on. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. 6% of the meta games. <laughs> <laughs> that means 24% of the time they won't have it right. Yeah. Now. That's where mono that, That's red the shines. other mono red viewer you're playing against now. So you better make sure you tech for that. <laughs> Uh, anyway, Richard, if people want to send in fish mail for next week, how should they uh, do right. that? Send them to at MTG Goldfish with the hashtag MTG Fish Mail. Then we get to your questions on air. And I believe that brings us to the end of episode 397 of the MTG Goldfish podcast. So, Richard and Krem, thanks for hanging out. Thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks to Card Conduit for supporting the show. And we'll be back next week to talk about whatever goes on in the world of magic. So until then, have a spectacular week, everyone. And this is a crew signing out.